man. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Your brother faced with hard luck. Face to face. Face to face with hard luck. Pimps card shots. Steve Smurdy was with hard luck. Pimps and card shots. Steve Smurdy was with hard luck. Your brother faced with hard luck. Face to face. Good morning and welcome to the Hard Luck Show. I'm your certified host, Steve Lucky Luciano. Sitting across from me is my co-host and my partner. It's Chumahan Bone, American Indian, Southern Californian, elegant barbarian, here with another fucking awesome fucking show once again. And old Blue Eyes himself, our engineer. Sean Lewis, certified audio professional engineer. For the Hard Luck Show. Ah, uh, oh, a la verga. Time. A la verga. Gets me every time. Um, we've got Big Pick Mike in the house. Uh, and yeah. We've got King Salmon in the house. Both right. animal visuals. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, today. Today. We have a very special guest, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, reigning out of the East Coast, out of New York, uh, my very good friend, Don Capria, yeah. director, writer, just a marvelous Triple talent. threat, triple threat. Quadruple threat. Quintuple threat. Hey, uh, uh, Sean, is there a way I'm going to be able to see my guy on the screen? Right. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, drinking coffee. Don Capria, welcome to the show, my brother. Yes. How's everybody doing? What's up, Doc? Good to What's see you happening? again. Well, I can't see you yet, but kind of. And then uh, no? we, oh, okay. we did see we did see each other in close quarters a week ago, which was great. This is twice in one week, my friend. We're at a, yeah. we're at Peter Conti's wedding. Oh, yeah, yes. And, Con- uh, congratulations to Peter Conti. Big shout out to Pete Conti. Yes, a very romantic affair. Lovely. Oh, yeah, it was lovely. Sexy adult situation going up on a <laughs> mountain up there in Santa Barbara, and we had a great time. No better place to get married in Santa Barbara. Yeah, that's it. Mm. Yeah, we did it, man. Listen, Solid. man, I've been, I've been, yeah. I've been. The, the... Go ahead. It was good, right? Okay. It, All right. Yeah, it was. It was good. It was good. It was good. So listen, man, I brought, I was telling, uh, can we, listen, th- this guy's done a lot of different things. He's going to take us through it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Don is somebody who put out uh, a magnificent book just recently. I just got the book and just started it. Can you hold that up to the camera, Chuman? Yes. Let's take a look at that. Um the unsolved murders uh well look at colombo's the name of the book man don caprio wrote it i just started it the amount of information and knowledge that don has about just this topic in general um is incredible he's also he's working on a lot of different things don caprio entering the conversation brother talk to me man uh, when what, yeah. what, what, talk to us, man? Let us know. I told my friends a little bit about you. You have a little yeah. bit of a tattered history. Uh, you were in some places on vacation. You're a director. <laughs> you wrote this incredible book. You know what? A lot of your friends, Big Lux, have been on vacations. Every time I talk to you, you got a bunch of vacation buddies. Yeah, and this is another one. Of how them, did 3, you, miles So away. how did you guys meet? How do you guys know each we other? We met through Pete Conti and through Estevan Oriol. Okay. He's very close True. with Estevan Oriol. Very close with Pete. Um, and they both kind of cammed it. Him and Pete are working together on some things. I think him and Steve are going to eventually work on some things. So he's tied in that way. Got it. Got it. All right. So, you know, first thing I would like to know, though, is just for the uninitiated people that don't understand, why in, did you write this book, Colombo, and what is it really about? Um. I had always been a, a, a mob fan, you know, I, I, as a young kid, I think a lot of guys, you know, they idolize these men, you see them and in, in the East Coast, you have some of them in your neighborhood and it's definitely in, in your daily news. So I started reading a lot of the books and got really involved in, in nonfiction. And uh, at one point I, I was getting really interested. There's the five families, you know, Columbo was the youngest person to ever head one of the five families. And I started reading about him and I started only seeing a few stories and people would just kind of like change the adjectives and put it in another book, put it in another book. And no one was ever really writing a full story on him. So 
I had wanted to to maybe explore doing a story and someone told me you can't do that because his children are still alive. So you would need a blessing to to move forward with that. So I just left it alone. And then I was working on a project. I got a phone call from a friend of mine who was also on vacation. And uh, he he said that you still look and do something with Joe Colombo. And I was like, sure. He's like, what the phone? He wants it to sound like, you know, Italian from the Bronx, which he was. And uh, he's just, you know, kind of questioning me on like why I would want to do the story. What did I know about Joe? And then he asked me if I'd like to have brunch or well, breakfast on Sunday with Joe's oldest son, Anthony, who was still alive. Mm. So I drove to upstate New York from Queens and I got to this diner and it was the guy, Ray, that I was speaking to on the phone. Uh, Anthony Colombo, who was about 70 at the time, Joe's mm. oldest son. Mm. Anthony Colombo Jr., who was Joe's grandson, is a, a actual federal defense attorney in San Diego now. Wow. And then their driver. So we all sat down at this round table, and Anthony just started asking me questions about myself. You know, um, I had never written a book before. I was interested in doing a screenplay, but they were having problems with their book writer. So I think. After a good two hours at the table, I answered some things that, that he probably didn't think I knew, and he was impressed by that, which was a lot about the Colantel Pro operation and the FBI conspiracy possibly involved in the shooting. Um, and, and when I started talking about the Italian American Civil Rights League and my knowledge of the Italian American history over five generations, he he really he dug that, and he told Ray, you know, I think this is the guy for the book. After that, I had to submit a chapter to their agent, and the agent loved it, and. Three and a half years later, I was done with a 400-page manuscript. So, wow. All right, so backing uh, up for a second, <clears throat> I heard you say COINTELPRO, which uh, is an FBI program that at least most people understand it to have targeted, let's say, the Black Panthers and to undermine and, and do it. How was it also related to uh, Italian-American Civil Rights League? So when Hoover started COINTELPRO, he was modeling a CIA operation that was working internationally. And what it really was was to try to create disinformation campaigns against any kind of dissident group. So the political dissident groups that they were first after were the communists. Right. So before even the Black Panthers, they were trying to rid the, the country of communists post-World War II. Right. Uh, as boredom progresses inside the FBI offices, they start looking for any political dissident group. So that's when they went after the Black Panthers, whether underground, uh, a lot of the small communist parties, radical Jewish uh, activism groups. And one of them that they were after were the mobsters. They, they thought, well, why can't we fuse this operation in with our uh, organized crime task force and really shake the foundation of these these mobsters and the Red Scare? So one of the pieces that I through FOIA, which was to uh, social clubs from unknown sources that these communist groups were looking to bomb the social clubs because they didn't like Italians. What this was done, these were all done by the FBI. It was all part of counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. So no one was saying anything, but it started street beef. So now the Italians are wondering why the communists are messing with them. And then the communists are getting, you know, shook down by the Italian mobsters. So this was part of one of the dirty ops tricks that these guys were doing. And, you know, there was a few other cases that were documented. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff was was thrown out and redacted. Um, but there was a there was operations yeah, against the Italian Americans. And when the Italian American Civil Rights League gained so much power so fast, you know, that went right into the crosshairs of Hoover and he needed to do something about it. Now that we're on the topic of Hoover, this is something I've read and always heard about. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. The rumors are, they're not, I don't think they're rumors, Hoover was a cross-dresser, dressed as a woman, and uh, maybe even went by the name of Debbie. Yeah, no, no rumor. Right. <laughs> so how does that work? Because on some level, Hoover's, um, and you're kind of seeing this a little bit again today, where it's like these sort of fascist or proto-fascists that are very very much about we're going to get back to traditional whatever it is they seem to also be the same people that are 
cross dressing behind closed doors <laughs> and maybe you know jerking noodles and doing whatever <laughs> Jer- jerking wires loose huh? <laughs> you know what i mean like wh- wh- from from what you understand about history right everyone's like let's make you know let's go back to the 50s but i mean that's when hoover was walking around with pumps and looking weird <laughs> so what from your thought like what do you think about that or what are, what are some ideas you have i mean you know it, it goes back way 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 further than hoover you know i think that that there's always been these people that have this certain profile in society and potentially with a lot of power that you know behind the curtain have other things happening and and you know whether it be someone that was just cross-dressing or someone that was you know a, a homosexual or there there's all these different escapisms i think that happen with these men that are in power and that's the ones that are the most fascinating right it's like right. it doesn't matter that you're your UPS guy is a cross dresser on his spare time. It only matters when it's like your state assemblyman, right? Because right. now it's like, wait a minute, you're not what you appear to be, you know, because if if you were as we see now, there are people in politics who are, you know, they're not behind the veil with it. Right? Like they're not just cross dressing too. They're they choose to have, but let's just say for instance, transgender or you know, uh, uh, I could even say transvestite or, Gender but they're cross dressing. Yeah, I mean transformer. Right. You know, they're they're <laughs> they're doing something that what we look at, we obviously we see something that doesn't really fit in the line with what we're used to seeing. And and Hoover was one of them. But I think Hoover's favorable to the the mobsters over them a lot a heavy degenerate gambler um so that i think was another vice of his that that he had that gave favor to the mobsters because as the the mobsters always said that there was no such things la cosa nostra and whatnot hoover really didn't attack them but then he did you know on paper when the organized crime task force began you know i think it was after the Palacci papers and frank costello and all that that he, he had to go full force there was no more escaping it and so you know i think at this juncture now is something i've thought about maybe you could speak to this too though it does seem in in, in, that every quote unquote you want to call it that right official government which has created rules and set up something also needs a group that can operate below the radar it's almost like I, i it's almost like you can't really have a society unless you have here is the mainstream, what we all pretend is really going on. And then you also need uh, para society. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. Black, the, the, the black ops. So that's really what it was. I mean, it continued all the way up until they were going to, you know, try Paul Castellano. Right. So there's all these different operations that they have, these these black bag operations where they're illegally wiretapping. And and now it's it's if you were to take a you know, millennial and just pluck them out of society and say, hey, you know, we think the government's listening to your phone conversation. They're just like, OK, you know, like there's there's no more fear of police state. It's kind of like it's been so it, it's you know, it's a 50, 60 year plan where we've been just hit with all of these different liberties that were stripped away to the point where now it's just like yeah why am i worried that the government's listening to my phone calls and this and that and why wouldn't i tell on my best friend or what you know we were completely you know it's it's whatever integrity we had and loyalty towards our own liberties it's completely emulsified it's it's long gone well that's true but i'm you know and so to to be on the other side of that discussion i think like well wait a second though i mean so uh, the toothpaste is already out of the tube. It's not going to go back in. And so maybe privacy is not about real privacy in the sense of you're going to be able to find spaces where, you know, it's not recorded. But it's usability at the public level for criminal prosecutions and other stuff now has to be more clearly regulated so that every citizen who has been forced into the social contract that if i want to use apps if i want to use this if i want to use that i've consented to a private company that is going to listen into everything so i don't have privacy and that private company is got some sort of deal with the government otherwise they're not allowed to do any business and so they're going to share that information and the implied promise is sort of like 
Yeah, it's true. I mean, and this is even an Obama, and I'm an Obama fan, okay, so I'm not, but it is kind of true. They say, well, yeah, it, but we're not using it for criminal prosecutions, right? We're, we're just, we're trying to do international shit. And I think that at some level, we're going to have to um, embrace, like, well, then we got to get serious at the, at the domestic level that, yeah, you can't use any of that stuff for domestic criminal prosecutions because it does violate the Constitution. It does violate the rights that every American is granted at the zero level. We, we don't have to pay for those rights. We don't have to earn those rights. It's part and parcel with the social... Inalienable. Co- exactly. It's, it's part of... The, the, uh, you can't have yeah. an American as citizen without those rights. So yeah. in, in discussing all that, though, so in talking about some of the subjects, right, uh, that are in your book, Columbo, and, and, and that crime family that maybe wasn't or that family that wasn't understood uh, very well or the story wasn't told well, um, So COINTELPRO did a pretty damn good job of fucking up the Black Panthers. And the organized crime, if you want to call it that, or mob, right, if you want to call it that, whatever you want to call it, it's almost like a treasured American institution in a lot of ways, right? So COINTEL did do some things to disrupt, and yet America loves its Italian-American institution. Right. And so what well, we, the, yeah, we love the underdog. Right. But so are the Black Panthers. But we don't there's not a national. I mean, Goodfellas, who doesn't love Goodfellas? I'm not saying that's reality, but I am saying who doesn't love that? Who doesn't love the Godfather? Who doesn't understand the sort of loyalty? Right. That is talked about in some of those institutions. It, it, it almost seems like so I feel like my personal feeling is is that most Americans admire or at least l- in, in embrace that institution do you do you think that's true or not you know in a way that it doesn't embrace the other underdogs hmm. yeah I think that you know the Italian American gangsters have always been romanticized and it really broke into the commercial space like no one has ever seen it before with the the godfather film sure i think there was many films prior to that and there was, there was many instances of, of organized um you had carl Gamble, you know but like once the godfather happens this fictionalized story based on on these people but showing the backdrop of the italian american family from that point on, it was it was the, it's the most romanticized thing that we see in crime and entertainment. Um, and, and we're now just starting to see um, how in, in, in furtherance it can come into it. I think the best example for me was, you know, like the Narco series yeah. um, that came out on Netflix a few years back where they really – they gave you a, a real good look at Pablo and his family. And, you know, so again, regardless of whatever he did to, to you know, make the make the donuts, uh, this guy is lovable, you know, and, and, right. and this character is someone that we care about. And then, mm-hmm. you know, follow up with that would be Peaky Blinders, you know, An- another great character. Him, he is fictionalized. Where Pablo Escobar's story is mostly real from the Narcos, um, I, I see that we're starting to get a lot more pop culture, uh, lovable characters that are actually killers. You know, right? But but I almost and now that we're talking about this, this is interesting because this is also about entertainment, and it's also about because I was thinking about it too, like what you're saying. It's almost, but it almost, it's almost like my friend that the Italian American version set the mold or set the form that other groups have come into that will put maybe their own little twist on it, but the underlying structure and the underlying, um, even if you wanted to call it, it's not a rituals, right? Or even some of the emblematic things that one has on their person, let's say seem to have like really kind of born out of that romanticization romanticization i I think i think that i think true i think everybody kind of uses that as a template 
right. especially other uh, organizations, right. right? And I think, you know, from the beginning of time, it's been like the Sicilian mob, the black hand, like that's what, that's where I, it started. I, I, huh? I should interject there though. So while the, while the black hand c- comes over from Sicily and has, uh, um, let's say it's protocol and it's set up, the, the the mustache Pete era of gangster is not what we saw in organized crime modernism. You know, Lucky Luciano and the Five Families. Absolutely, where that came from actually was learned from the Jews. So you know, you had you had uh, you know Lepke and you had Meyer Lansky, uh, you had you know uh, Doc Stacher, you had all all these Jewish American gangsters. Well, and some of them were immigrants. Uh, Bugsy, yeah. So, so a lot of those leaders, the way that they were setting up, was more. Um, it was a very modern style of how to operate crime, and uh, you know, uh, I, I would say it was probably uh, in the in the roaring twenties that that those guys started to story that we're doing everyone what the culture trend was for the jewish americans because theirs was a very simple story it was based on poverty and neighborhood where right. in, in the past in the late 1800s you had uh shape ups you know that's where, where people would show up to go to work and they would be picked in a, in a pile of men you right know, if we only had a, we only got 20 of them you know we picked 20 so when the shape ups were happening and, and everyone was uh you know working for for less than they were what, the, what they were supposed to be getting then they would have a strike and when the strikes took place that's when the, the Jewish gangsters would rise. They, you know, you could be a gangster by saying, "I got like fifteen guys with me." So the owner of the company would would hire you and say, "Okay, well, I'm going to pay you to break this strike, strike breakers." And these guys would come in and they would beat down these. Work and then they would settle some type of agreement. Somebody working for these these richer Jewish uh, immigrants that don't come to my neighborhood, don't care about my neighborhood. They live in the Upper East Side. I'm living in Brooklyn. I'm living in Lower East Side in a flat, and I'm going to fight my own pe- people that I have to see every day to make that guy's business better. Right. So what he started doing was infiltrating the unions, and he started to say, "I'm going to, I'm not going to strike break. I'm just going to put these two together, and I'm going to be the mediator, and I'm going to." implement and create a union and i'm going to put my men in the union business so when the, the jewish american gangsters were only a single generation the italian americans were like pedigree colombo family right it's still called the colombo family today although joe colombo has been shot 1970s 1971 so why is it still the colombo well it was about a legacy and and they wanted to keep a stronghold on something in many generations decades it's almost been now so it's uh it's very very interesting but it came from the jewish american gangster wow how let me ask you something how much of it was taken from like rome doctrine doc doctrine right okay so wait that's a great question uh big luck so right how much of what do you wait what do like you mean like the capo capo regime what do you mean like- by rome doctrine like the Roman Empire, how they right? Were set up. Yes. How so, much of it was does it does derive from that, if any influence? Um, yeah, I would say a lot as far as the, the power structure, the, the the protocol for for everything. I think that you know they have that in Italy, they had that in Sicily. You know, all the the, the Camorra, right. um, you know, the mafia, all, all the different organizations always have that power structure, soldiers and whatnot. <laughs> So I think that once Luciano was putting this all together um, to modernize it, that and that's the difference between the Black Hand or the Mustache Pete's, right? It was that sure. just it was a boss of bosses, and he just told people what to do. Sometimes they used the word lieutenant, but it was really it was structured the same way we see it. And I definitely think that it comes from a more military style structure. Do you? Let me ask you something. If we were to like fast forward a little bit today. And uh, and take a look at the mob today. You know, there's a lot of people that would say the mob's busted up. Days are over. Mm. It's a wrap. When we both know that's not completely true, but I mean, it, 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 from from zero to a hundred, what's the potency of the mafia today in comparison to 1970? I 
think it could be at like maybe 20% of what it wow. was making, um, you know, in, in the salad days of the mob. Um, as far as, uh, as far as, you know, being a, a force to be reckoned with, maybe around 30%, 40%. I, I don't think we live in a society anymore that allows the shadows to be feared as it was many, many years ago. And well, I, I think there's a, you know, there's a flip side to that too, where, where, you know, if you look at the neighborhoods in New York, uh, you know, I, I always had this saying, and it, and it goes like this, when you dismantle organized crime, you start the foundations for the crazy things that we see happening in society in New York, especially would be happening if there was still organized crime running. Absol- the neighborhood. That's interesting. You say that, bro. You hear what he said? Yeah, that's, I think that's yeah. real, bro. I mean, but the thing is, is so, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, so, so, so this is important. And this is partially why I was saying that, like, you can't really have a real society unless you have some other, sh- unless you have shadows. And the thing of it is, is that I agree, but I think we have new shadows now. Yeah, they're different. They look different. They're different. Right. So, so, uh, uh, so in the evolution of whatever can live in the shadow, what needs to live in the shadow in order to have some kind of freedom and discretion, right? Mm-hmm. From view. What, Safety. Yeah. Whatever that is, right? Yeah. When that shadow changes, then there may be new opportunities for groups that may before might not have understood how to operate in the old shadow, but the perfectly positioned to op- operate in the new shadows. And these pinch points of discretion, you keep, we keep thinking as Americans and as people of technology that the better technology gets, the smarter we become, there's not going to be any more shadows. There's no room for them. But the truth is, is that there's just newer pinch points. Right. And that's oh, yeah. what sophistication is all about think it's, tanks and all that shit yeah because how else can you squirt illegal weapons to another country <laughs> without it coming on the books it still right, happens yeah. day in and day out despite that we have complete surveillance of the entire world from satellites yeah right i mean I, i'd love to see the schematic on how much money pickpockets were taking in the 1980s, <laughs> the, the wallet versus how much money cyber theft is taking out of the digital currency. Right, right. Because, Everybody's still getting robbed. Yeah, we were told right. we were going to be safe, but it's still happening now. They're just able to track everything that we do. Well, about- I will. I want it. Yeah. What the fuck's up with that? How about when they were pitching all that shit that you didn't need to keep your money and your wallet in your front pocket? No, no, no. This is safer now. Now nobody can get you. And all that shit goes in. It's some bullshit, man. It's it's like uh, some medicine. And then 20 years later, they're telling you there's a lawsuit because that shit wasn't right. Oh, it's not addictive. It's not addictive. Take as much as you want, babe. You can't get addicted to this. Side note. Side note. (laughs) Side note. It's the biggest fucking, the biggest fucking scam. No, well, uh, yes, but I always say, I always say, as I was growing up as a kid, they sold the California lottery to us. Oh, here we go. Based on the fact that it was going to help schools. (laughs) Do you know that since the lottery came out? Schools have gotten worse. The public school system, education, the 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 maintenance, the upkeep, the the all this shit that they promised. Computers, desks, like our schools are going to be beautiful now because they've gotten worse. Well, Where did all the California lottery money go? Because they sold it to everybody because it was going to help our schools. Listen, 100%. what's the matter with you? The rich people's schools are really good right now. Oh, but it's no- just yeah. more bullshit that they sell us, and then I feel like nobody really so comes back. On. Dude, where they grab? Where they grab that from? The numbers, you know, they they locked up a lot of men for many years. The the U.S. government for running numbers, right? And then they True. they just modeled what what it was, and they said, oh, well, we're just do it legally now, and all those guys could still sit in jail for what they did. You know, well, that's fucking what they, assholes, the motherfuckers. Hey, but listen, listen, La Cosa Nostra. Listen to me. <laughs> God damn it. It's getting crazy. Listen, you're all right. You're all correct. 
Mm -hmm. You're all absolutely correct. But to chase the hypocrisy of it is to be a day late and a dollar short. Yes, sir. Okay? Because, Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, same thing with drug dealing. What did they do? Well, that heroin shit's working great. All right, we're going to throw you all in jail and we're going to switch it over to Big Four. And we're going to handle that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Now that we know you can sell it and we know how it works. And we know how addictive it is. And now we'll take it over. Pickpocket is still... Listen. So my point being is, is this is what I'm saying. Innovation in a capitalist system actually operates best in the illegal zone. You, it's almost if you were to take the the if you were to take the the morality out of it, the ethics out of it. Forget all that bullshit. Mm. Okay, set that aside for a second. Yeah, tell that to Mother Teresa. No disrespect. Here, but you were to say, here's the shadows. All right, mm-hmm. and we're gonna create a an a laboratory of humans, desperate humans. We're gonna put desperate humans in a room, and we're gonna put a set amount of money and some drugs and some blah, da 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 and we're just gonna watch what happens and see the patterns that develop. The patterns that look like you're gonna be making a lot of money with a, a little risk and as a little output as possible, running numbers, fucking Oxycontin, all that shit, cigarettes, mm-hmm. right? We're gonna make it a crime, get rid of all the innovators that came up with it, lock them out, and then create a legal regime for it to operate in like booze and allow the fucking marijuana marijuana allow right the wasps or whoever it is in connecticut Mm -hmm. to actually own the shit and make money legally and they'll never have to go to jail right that's what that is it's a fucking the street is the lab and they let motherfuckers innovate shit until it looks like it's working good Throw and away then you're the key. out. And you're out. Yeah. And that's the price, you know, and then they turn around and go, well, you shouldn't have broke the law. Mm. And then they pass a law that <laughs> makes it legal. There you go. How yeah. is that? I mean, it, it, I mm. mean, is that, is that about right? I mean, we are, we're definitely in a, in a, in a laboratory, all of us, <laughs> you know, I, I think at, I think at all levels, I think sometimes mm. there's even people up in the, the high seats, the high bleachers that are, uh, they don't know they're in a lab too because they got to the high bleachers without knowing. I think sometimes just by who they were, what family they were born into or who they married into or whatnot. Mm. You know, what's the, what's the end game? You know, what do you do? You know, besides try to, like you said, forget morality, but that's kind of the thing. It's like, you know, you were saying going back, dialing it back to the people, romanticizing the Italian mobsters. You know, I think one of the things that they really do see and like is that it's, you know, the boys club is uh there was loyalty you know back then and it was it was everything was real and it was realer than the government you know mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll pull a little piece the interview from my book i did with uh with al ruddy who made the godfather you know when he had uh his interactions with joe colombo he told me he said you know i'm i'm in i'm in the cesspool i'm in hollywood making a movie i'm i'm doing deals with guys that i'm signing these contracts that i paid lawyers and and i don't still don't trust them you know, I don't trust that they're going to keep their word on the contract that I already goes. But when I shook Joe Colombo's hand and he told me he was going to deliver said things for the <clears> film, <throat> I knew when I shook that man's hand that he was going to deliver those things. And he did. And he goes, and you don't find that in Hollywood. You don't find that in a million places in this country. Mm-hmm. He goes, but you found that amongst those men. And he, he goes, and I respected that. So, mm-hmm. right. Going back to your question, Big Lux, about, you know, was there anything in Rome uh, ancient Rome, right? Mm-hmm. That maybe set the stage for that or some kind of um, influences you can see. I would say, yes, based on what Mr. Capria just said, I would say that that type of loyalty and that type of relationship, apart from normal Roman society, existed at the level of the general and his soldiers. <clears throat> There was a time in ancient Rome when anybody who wanted to be a soldier could only be a soldier if they were a Roman citizen and had land, okay? Mm -hmm. At a certain point, Rome uh, got so big that you couldn't recruit an army like that anymore. You needed, right? And ultimately, the soldiers became more loyal to their general. If they were winning battles because the spoils of war, 
the courage of Julius Caesar, all of that, Pomp- Pompey, all of that stuff translated into the soldiers being very loyal to the general in the same way as the story that uh, Mr. Capria here, the, the renowned author, let's not lie and, 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 and fool ourselves, the renowned author who wrote that book um, and, and, and the um, interview that he was citing there. And that you don't get as an anonymous citizen to an anonymous state. I, I yes, and I agree with you on that. I, I think that there are certain types of um, in, in institutions uh, where men uh, understand where everything that would be on the outside in society that you could dress things up with. Some of the institutions that I'm aware of that I admire, and there's a lot of loyalty, and where it is, is these institutions where. All you had was your character, your word and your character. Right. Everything else kind of been stripped out. I think that that's a, there's a lot of that in the Italian culture due to many different reasons. You got to prove yourself. It's, you know, but I think too, like when you get to, I'm just going to say this, I'm going to say on the West Coast from where I'm from and loyalty and, and all that stuff, when you go to prison, I always say this all the time, everything's removed from you. Right. So you don't have the car to hide behind. You don't have the woman. You don't have the job. You don't have the all these different things. You're just, it's me and you, mano y mano. Yeah. It's all you got is your word and your actions, mm-hmm. you know? Mm. Um, and I remember my dad always telling me when I was a kid, you know, all you got is your word. That's your only you got. And I think that that's, that means a lot in certain cultures. When I shake your hand, there is no need for a contract. And that's in, only in certain cultures, man. And, and I'm more p- drawn to that. Um, right. But here's the downside of, of that system. And, and I'm playing, I'm not even playing devil's advocate. I'm just explaining that. Okay. So when you got a good leader... And, the, and you have that system, that system allows the individual's qualities to really come to the forefront and dictate what it's going to be. Because for every great leader where the, the followers are like, man, I touched that man and I looked him in the eye and I knew it was a done deal and I had nothing to worry about, there's probably like 10 nudniks who they, they were going in different circles and you couldn't trust them. So in a system where you have that kind of setup, you definitely need somebody you can trust. Sure. And so the electorate system, right? This sort of fucking, you know, the 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 uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the quote unquote American system, let's say, right? It it has its downsides. The, the 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 upshot is supposed to be that everybody's loyal to the system. Mm. Yes, the personality. Yes, is it Brock? Is it Trump? Is it fucking breadstick Biden? Who is it? Right. All those people, it does make a difference. But at the end of the day, the quality of the services are determined by the military's loyalty to the system so that when you get a lunkhead in that position, they're not going to ruin it, completely break the fucking thing. So like somebody uh, almost did, like somebody almost he he broke the Republican Party. I can tell you that Mm. that shit's fucked up. Well, I, I would say even, you know, further than just Republican Party and try to, def, you know, and I'm not defending the Republican Party. I'm just saying grouping in general. When you mention the word trust, you know, you have you have the you establish this group. Right. And that's that can be a clique. It could be a gang. It could be a baseball team. It could right. be a, a brand that makes films. Right. You put it into you put it into a group and we establish trust for that. Right. Like I know this A24 company is making good movies. Oh, I'm going to check out their movie because they have a brand. Right. They have a style. Mm. So then, you know, we, we play this into the system of police, right? And and what's Rampart known for? What is that division? They're known for being corrupt cops, just like the 7-5 in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So the, the grouping aspect of it is where we start to lose faith, right? Because we've seen so many instances where this group was supposed to be something we trust. Could have been the Democrats, could have been the Republicans, could have been your policeman. We could have been your insurance company. Could have been a guy that you invested money with that did a Ponzi scheme. 
And and we're just starting to learn that these crooks are are, are destroying all of these groups, and then it's hard for us to trust anything, you yes. know, um, including po- politics. Politics becomes very, and I, I don't really love talking politics too much, but it's it's just on a, from a psychological level, it's very hard for us to have institutions because there are so many bad apples amongst you know the groups. Well, and and successful institutions attract bad apples, right? I mean, so you have a successful institution, the first generation. They came up from where, that some situation and they mm-hmm. built something great. Then you get sometimes loafers, yeah, or right? Kids are the yeah. kids are the guys who built it. Yeah, you know? I mean, what the, why don't I just float on a fucking thing? I don't, <laughs> right? And then in, in even corporate America, right? So you Rifters. go like, right, you get a corporate America. But the interesting thing is I've been reading this book, right, that looks at all of the variations of the fairy tales. I'm not going to go deep into it because it's a little bit off topic. But the point being is, is that everything we know from Grimm and Mother Goose is a standardization that happened around the 1700s, 1800s, right? It's all based on Italian, French, German, British folk tales. Mm. All of which have multiple slight variations based on the region where they're from. Mm. The point being is, is that at that time, 1300s through the 1600s, you had the same fucking problem that we're dealing with now. Mm. Grifters, mm. con men, fucking. This is why uh, Red Riding Hood, the story is not about, it's weird. Everyone's like, that's a so fucking weird. She doesn't know that the wolf is his grandma. I mean, mm-hmm. what the fuck is this? When in the bed? What the hell's going on? Because at the time that these things were going out, uh, being told orally and all this other stuff, man, life was fucked, fucked at up. multiple levels. Mm. And the, the sin was being naive in a land of con men. That was the sin. If you couldn't spot trouble, mm. then you're fucked. And in the, all the normal ones... She gets eaten, and that's the end of it. There's no hunter. There's no saving them, and all that. But that didn't come. That good government. Yeah, it's bull- Americanized. Yeah, yeah that good yeah. government bullshit didn't come <laughs> in until about the, the 1800s. So my point yeah. being is, is that as frustrating as we feel today about politics, the institutions, the church, everything. It was fucked up, fucking. 500 years ago yeah because humans yeah. are crafty motherfuckers <laughs> and some of us yeah. want to get something for nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they hung jesus you know so yeah, <laughs> it's been, yeah i mean it's been going yeah. on a long time <laughs> yeah they fucking they've been fucking up forever society. hey they, they're even confused about whose fault is that right they're even they're confused like, to call him a him or a her or a she or a what and they were like hey, i don't know i mean you know it was it the jewish folks who switched him out for barabbas or was it the fucking romans who they didn't give a fuck who they were killing they just put this guy up on a cross they yeah. they still haven't got even that yeah they still don't have that clear yeah it's interesting so you know what don um how long ago did you put out the colombo book um the end of 2015 so it's been out for um about six years now so a little a little bit more than that have you so, uh is is this that your single uh, uh publication is this the first your, yes your first book? press um, yeah, we had a little bit of problem when, when our, our book went through its own trials and tribulations. We were first signed with Wiley, a uh, publisher out of New Jersey. It's been around for 100 years, and we signed with Wiley. Our agent was Mickey Freiberg, who did uh, Donnie Brasco. He did all the, Don, uh, the Joe Bonanno books. Uh, so he was a very successful mob-lit agent that would take his stuff, turn them into films. And... You know, when we got on board with Wiley, this company, we were we were really liked our editor. We really liked the way they spoke, allowed us the freedom to write the story how Anthony wanted to tell it. I think we were starting our marketing meetings and, and uh, all of a sudden there was a news article. My agent taps me and says, hey, Wiley just went public. They're, they're selling the company. And we're like, what? What does this mean? And he's like, well, they're they're going to get purchased. They're going to they're going to change everything and it was a family owned company so our book sat in limbo for like two and a half years i had finished writing this in about 2012 2013. so i sat for two and a half years watching emails go back and forth as an arbitration was to be had between our entertainment attorney and their attorneys we finally got the rights to the book back and we, we took like two meetings with publishers 
And at the time, Anthony's health wasn't so great. So we wanted to speed things along and make sure we got the book out. We didn't want to sit in limbo anymore. So we ended up uh, putting the book out ourselves. It was already vetted. We had already done everything that we had to do. It was a finished product on Wiley shelf. Um, so we always thought that once there was a, a film about to be in place, we would do a second edition, do a hardcover edition. We have some newer photos. We have some newer information surrounding the conspiracy. Um, currently, there's a documentary in the works, a three-part docuseries. And then after that, we're hoping the next thing's going to be a scripted series. Gotcha. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah. He's been played a lot. I don't know if you guys uh, got to see the offer on Paramount+. I did. Plus. I did. Yeah, so Giovanni Rabisi portrays Joe Colombo, and he plugs the book a lot in his interviews, which I was very grateful for. Um, in this newest season of The Godfather of Harlem, uh, there's going to be a Joe Colombo character. Not a big fan of the way that they're writing him because absolutely nothing is true. He mm -hmm. never had dealings with this gangster from Harlem. He never sold drugs. As a matter of fact, he was vehemently opposed to drug dealing, and they're making him a heroin dealer and a hothead. So it's just, you know, these guys are trying to cash in yeah. uh, without without doing the research. I, I have to call them a hack. A hack is a hack, you know, and I, I know. Oh, you heard it here first, baby. A yeah, hack is I, a I, hack. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate what he's done. Narcos was great. And I know Paul Eckstein is very good friends with my mentor, Richard Stratton. But these guys just went and grabbed some stuff they thought was hot and just, you know, threw it in the in the pan without doing the research. And it's upsetting because as a writer, you know, it takes a lot of time to do this. And I built a book for them that could have been used as a model, um, which Giovanni Rubisi used as a basis for his character. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, Joe was also played in the Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. They they re um, cut the shooting. What was so your what was your take on The Irishman? How did you what, what's your review of that? Yeah, I mean, it's the same as the book. It's a very interesting story. It's also maybe 20% true. So Frank <laughs> Sheeran was on his deathbed. He starts telling all these stories. You know, yeah. I think, you know, in, in one one of the stories, he farted in a spaceship and then made the rings around Saturn. I mean, the guy like you're saying that's not true. Do? No, 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 no. I got to see. I got to see. You know, it's like these guys, you know, you you kind of do these self-preservation stories. And a lot of these rats that we see, and I, I, yeah. I you know, I'm opposed to that on, on the Internet. And I, I think a lot of kids are, they become fanboys of these men because they don't really understand what these men did. Um, and not mm, Yeah, them. there you go. There you go. There, there's there's guys that are out there with their YouTube podcasts and their Instagram accounts, and they're making money off the fact that they told on a lot of men. And sometimes we only get to hear the story that they told on one man. But the mm -hmm. truth is with the FBI, it doesn't work like that. Right. You tell on many. So their, their, their life becomes better than not just one person, but 15 people or 20 people, depending on how many they, they dry snitch on or they show up in court and testify against. And the problem is that a, a lot of these guys, that no one's ever going to refute their story. So they become internet sensations. They sit here and they say things that will have – Absolutely no fact checking. No one's gonna no one's gonna come out from you know Lewisburg Penitentiary and say, Hey, hey, listen, Joey Numnuts is telling a fake story about me right now, and he told a fake story about my grandfather. And no, right. these guys just do it with impunity. And it's it's sickening that they're making money off it, and it's sickening that society is embracing them, you know. Well, society uh, doesn't really know, but you're right, it makes total sense what you're saying. It's like it as somebody who does that for the authorities and they act like it's just one time or something, it really doesn't work like that. It's a it it's a bargain with like the that. devil and, the, <laughs> and they keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing as much as they can get. The, the Gotti story is the most famous. They're like, well, if it was me or him and blah, blah, blah. okay, well, then what about the other 14 guys he sent up the river? Right. It's, you know. Now, uh, let me ask you a different question, and, and maybe this is fucking, uh, you know, sort of naive, but I, <clears throat> now I've watched The Sopranos twice, right? The full seasons twice. And, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, it seems like it's... It, right. It seems like it's pitching itself as maybe a more complex or uh, a, a little bit more realistic or grittier version of... Uh, of that that life or whatever that is right and but it still somehow retains 
the romanticism of it, right? It, even though the, my favorite, one of my favorite scenes is when they try to shake down a restaurant, but it's a corporate owned restaurant and nobody has access to the safe and none of the decisions, like, you know, because of everything's different now, it doesn't work like that. And, and there's <laughs> nothing they can do about it. Right. And so you kind of go like, oh, it's so then, but the other part of me is like, how did the romanticism still sort of, how does it still, how's it still working through The Sopranos, even though it kind of presents itself as a more, as a grittier, less glamorized version of, uh, of that, you know, if, that genre? It followed the same structure as The Godfather, uh, and it, it's a story that begins with an American family on the backdrop of the fact that they're a criminal family. So The Godfather is a Greek tragedy. It's, it's not a mob movie. It's a, it's a movie about a father who loses his his son who was to take over this criminal organization and and the good son, the one that he held sacred has to now get into this life of crime. So with the Sopranos, we, we see the struggle between Tony Soprano and, and wanting to, you know, relieve himself of these stresses that are actually going to never go away until he stops committing crime. And that's the entire show. It's how it's affecting him, how it's affecting his family. He could have been, you know, working, uh, you know, cutting, cutting trees down in the middle of the woods. And that's his high stress situation. And all these characters could have fit in as well. Mm -hmm. And the show still would have been great. It may not have been as big as the Sopranos, mm -hmm. but the writing and, and the intricacies of all the different, you know, he's cheating on his wife and he can't overcome that. And, you know, metals growing into a woman and he can't stop that from happening. So there's all these different things that it didn't matter that he was a gangster, it, it, but that backdrop, you know, it stays romanticized, but I think it's because it's a family show at its core. I want to ask you another question because you're a writer too. <clears throat> in The Godfather, there was, and maybe it was Godfather 2, there's a moment, like, so you never hear from the mother, ever, right? It's the dad and the sons, it's, uh, right? You don't hear anything. Yet, there's this crucial time where you can see Michael equivocating a little bit, uh, concerned about maybe this decision to kill Fredo. That's uh, Godfather 2. Right. And he goes to his mother. And he goes to his mm -hmm. mother. And it's right. darker now, right? Yep. It's darker. Yep. Okay. Yep. And he asks his mom, if I trying to protect my family, I could also lose it. And she tells him, but you could never lose your family. I, I watch that. And like every time I'm like, that's the wrong advice if for the Greek tragedy. That's what a lot, I think like that's what allows him to take that final step. What are your thoughts on, on what the role of the mother is and her advice to her, the good son, the son with the potential? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. Those two movies side by side have a lot of differences, but at the same time, they're just as good as one another. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do feel that the rules were taken, like in the rules of horror, where you had to go a little further, you know, and, and killing Fredo was the going a little bit further. So, um, oh man, does it take it away from the Greek tragedy? It may, yeah, it, 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 it definitely, it can't be the same thing, right? It has to be something new and different. And, and then the third one, they just made all the wrong turns. So when the, when, <laughs> right, when the mother, right, so the father's already gone. Mm -hmm. When the mother doesn't tell her son there are some things you just shouldn't do there's a line you can't cross and and this is one of them when she doesn't do that and and, and listen i'm not trying to be any kind of disrespect at all these are fictional characters but does that mean that don corleone and his wife were not good parents I mean, we we have to know that he's he's not a good parent, right? I mean, that's that's immediate. You know, this guy depends on what your definition of good is. Let me back that up <laughs> because oh, because oh, what does the good mean? I mean, I don't know. Well, let's back it up. Go ahead. Don't understand, and I say this too a lot about you know the the rat situation is like you know you don't understand the situation until you're in it right yeah. so it's hard for people to even conceive what these people are doing and it's the same way with crime and poverty right so we do get a great amount of backstory in the second godfather film on how this immigrant becomes the don and and i think that it's impossible for us especially in this society where we're arguing over pronouns mm -hmm. to understand what it was like to 
have to fight for food to understand to even you know you can read about the great depression right mm -hmm. but you don't you don't have any idea as a human being in in this generation and the past generation and the ones before that to mm -hmm. even understand what that is yes we don't you know so to to say he wasn't a good parent i i take that back because he was what he needed to be to make his family survive in that society and I think that, you know, a lot of Italian American immigrants were molded through the roaring 20s into gangsters because they weren't offered other forms of work. You know, there was there was no one in the school systems. There was no female Italian teachers. It was just impossible for them to find work in other areas because of the language barrier, because of the color of their skin. And yes, the Italian Americans were judged by the color of their skin. Yeah. If you look at the majority of the Italian Americans that came from the Mezzogiorno, the south part of Italy, on their paperwork, including my grandfather's, it says swarthy right. um, because their skin was not white. Their skin was was colored. Um, so was he and was she and not a good parent? I, I would say they they were exactly what they needed to be in that situation. So so, uh, you know, right. And I like this question because I think this is part of what the drama is, at least for me. Part of the drama is how am I looking at these, like you said, two people that came from nothing and nobody was giving them anything and then they had to overcome. And then also at the same time, you know, from a dramatic standpoint, they were, you know, at least the Don was punished because the potential son, the one that wasn't supposed to get involved in this got pulled into it. And looking at the epilogue section of your book, Columbo, I did notice that there was some similarity to that, right? In the, in the, um, can you tell us just a little bit about in real life, how that, that kind of manifests itself where the son who maybe follows in the father's footsteps, let's say, right? Uh, can confess or say that I don't know that my dad would have wanted this for me or I know he didn't want it He had to do it, but he didn't want it for me, but I had to do what I had to do How is that? How is that working out or what what themes and what things do you think about when you hear that in in a real situation? Yeah, I mean Anthony's situation was was unique and it was also hauntingly familiar to Michael Corleone's mm -hmm. and the, the the parallels between the Godfather film and the Colombo crime family are are very they're, they're eerie it's 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 uh first starts off with Mario Puzo himself writing a lot of the stories that he was reading in the paper and hearing while he was gambling in Vegas about the Colombo family so you know for instance is uh you know, Luca Brazzi sleeps with the fishes. This is this is a tale that comes from the Gallo crime family during the Gallo Profaci conflict, which, which is the Colombo family. Um, before it was called the Colombo family, it's called the Profaci crime family. And their main enforcer, Joe Jelly, was this this robust, you know, four four and a half foot high, four and a half foot wide gangster who handled all of the hardest stuff for the for the Gallos, and he was lured out to a fishing trip. By a, a guy that he was in World War II with, Sally D. And they thought they were going to discuss the conflict, one guy on each side, and, and figure out what they were going to do to make this thing go away. And they ended up killing Joe Jelly. And then they wrapped his shirt in a newspaper and some seaweed and threw it out in front of the gallo haunt. And that became the message that he sleeps with the fishes. Um, mm -hmm. And then getting out of the, the actual nonfiction stories that Puzo puts into the book. You know, you have the scene where Michael Corleone is is in waiting at the hospital with the florist so that he can see his father and finds out there's no police presence and he's worried about the other gangs coming. And Anthony Colombo telling me the stories of when, you know, he's in the hospital and the FBI shows up there to tell them that, like, look, we can't keep all these policemen here, but we do need you to know that, you know, there's going to be a hit put out on you and put out on your sister and we're going to protect you, but you have to cooperate with us and this. And, you know, Anthony's telling them, protect me like you protected my father. You know, mm. go fuck yourself. Get out of here. And and he refutes that and and refuses to, to allow them to be around him or his, his father because his father's still, you know, up in Roosevelt Hospital awaiting more surgeries. And he tells me about walking out of that hospital and this is before the film's even released this is in 1971 the film doesn't come out for a year later 
and and then he sees these scenes and and it's you know hauntingly familiar to him so there, there's a lot of stuff and then of course you know anthony's father never wanted him to go into the the lifestyle never even really told him he was involved in the lifestyle he wanted him to be a public servant he wanted he would send him to the valley forge military academy he wanted him to run the italian american civil rights league get into civil service so mm-hmm. Then years later, he ends up getting you know involved in the rackets, and and he did show uh, remorse. He did show some regret with all that. But at the same time, he told me, you know, I had a I had a big task in front of me, and I was the oldest in my family, and I'm the oldest male, and I needed to take care of all of them. I had my father that needed surgeries. I needed to go out there and earn, and the only way I can earn to take care of this that fast without the college diploma or the business was was to get involved with these men. Well, you heard it here first, right? We got to stop lying to ourselves and fucking around. How do people get your book? What are all the ways they can get this book? I think the easiest way for everybody right now is just go to Amazon and, and Columbo, The Unsolved Murder. We have a website, columbobook.com. We have an Instagram, Columbo Book. Uh, my personal Instagram, Don Capria, but the easiest way to plug and get this book is Amazon. And then you could leave a fantastic review when you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Leave a review. Mm. And is there an electronic version of your book? There is a Kindle version. Uh, so you can get that on Amazon as well. And, um, I think we're working on the audible next. So that, that should be coming around. I'd say hopefully by like the song. They need to have you, you narrate the whole thing. You need your voice done. Right. I, I need to get somebody to play uh, Anthony. So I need a dark, gra- gravelly voice to play Anthony to tell the father son stories as well. Oh, no, Maybe we'll call looks. you. Luke. <laughs> my mama yeah. looks over there. <laughs> yeah, I got that. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So Big Lux is available, uh, Don, for a reading. <laughs> I'm his agent. You go through me. All right. right we'll right, negotiate right. a friend price, friend and family, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> a vacationer's price. Uh, yeah. We're going to have Dom on the show when he comes into town we're going to talk about his other project next which is a film he's working on um and i don't want to give up too much but we're going to have don come in in person and do the yeah. next uh the next podcast with us and uh because this guy is so creative i mean he's got he's got some things going on for a uh, mini series possibly a fucking uh uh a series um, he's got this film that he's doing that I think Cookies is going to get involved in and whoever else I can rally around. Um, but there's a lot more to talk about, man. I just enjoy <coughs> having you on and talking. I, you know what? You know what? I'm going to say this. on Say air. it. Don't hold back. You know, Don, <laughs> the way that you are able to gather information, and I know that you grew up uh seeing this and on the east coast i feel like there's a lot of a lot of interesting crazy stories on the west coast in gang culture and a lot of stuff and i feel like there may be still a lot more left on this coastline than there is on that coastline and i feel like uh you know you and a guy like esteban oriel and uh uh i i feel like there's a way to possibly tell or position or tell some of these stories from out on this coastline. If there was a way to, I, I just think that he's the miner. There's gold still on this side. Yeah, man. Like, I don't know. I don't know, bro. But whenever I, as I read and look at this stuff, I always say to myself, what if we could transplant Don over here? And really, really let you explain and share and educate you on what's going on out here so that you could help to put together projects for us. Because See, what we don't have is we don't have a writer on our team. Really. Right. That's right. And you know what? We have all the info. We have all the context. We have all the stories. We have all the, but we don't have as a writer. A guy that has the moxie. The moxie to put together. To like put, a, listen, he, not only did he put together Columbo, the unsolved murder. Available on Amazon right now. I don't mind plugging my buddy here, uh, his work, not him. Mm. I'm not much plugging him. Much yeah, appreciate right. I'm plugging the book. But the issue is, is right, not only is he talented, because listen, writing a book like that, but to be able to do it with the blessing 
Mm -hmm. Right. That's threading the needle. And then on top of that, to have some kind of fucking arbitration after you finished to have the fucking moxie. Cajones. To, yeah. My God. You guys to, got the fucking balls the size of a fucking horse to get this. Listen, done. who are you? Clydesdale. <laughs> but the point of the matter <laughs> is, is to stick with it and to stay with it through yes. all those ups and downs and frustration shows that he is the kind of guy that's got the grit. This guy's got it all. To fucking come on the West Coast. You guys need to go follow Don Caprio. Dude, you need to buy his and book. Buy his book. Buy three of them. Get up on the on this cat, bro. Listen, this dude's doing that. I'm just dying to work with Don. I don't mean to let the cat out of the bag, but this is going to be on Oprah's uh, Book of the Month Club, I think, in March, right? Yes, Not March. February, but March. March Oprah, March. right. They're going to be talking about And then the prices presents. are going to go up. She's a big fan. Oh, She's a big fan. Singing your praises. Um... Okay, She's right. A big fan. Columbo, the unsolved murder by Don Capria and Anthony Columbo. I mean, yeah, straight from the horse. Straight from. I mean, mouth. this is legit. This is how I fuck with this dude because these are the legit as they get on that end. So, man, hey Don, again, it was great to see you in in Frisco. You and your girl up in Santa Barbara, and um, brother, I'll be out in New York in the next couple months. I'll come find you. We'll sit. We'll have an espresso and a fucking prosciutto sandwich. And, uh, man, bro, thank you, bro, for coming yeah. on today, man. We are we support you. Yeah. I need you on the show more. You're such a sharp, smart guy, man. We, we all got to learn a little bit. And the listeners as well got to learn a little bit about maybe something they weren't that familiar with but are definitely intrigued with. And uh, I appreciate you, brother. And I do, too. Your intelligence and eloquence comes through. Yep. I appreciate you both. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Salute. Thank you. You want to give any shout outs Thank to anybody? You, you want to shout out anybody? Uh, give, give a shout out to Anthony Colombo Jr., who everybody needs their first chance to write. And um, um, I was very happy to work with the family. They were amazing to work with on the project. Man, saludos going out to the Colombo family and the other four families. Yes. And Don Capria from New York. Thank you, brother. Have a great evening. Great respect. Great respect. All right, gentlemen. All right, brother. Thank right. you. We are out of here from the Hard Luck Show, L.A. to New York. Yeah. Peace.